For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Now, can you all hear me? Yes, Here I am. See, there's a glitch here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start again. As I said at the beginning of this, we tried a couple of weeks ago, and everything that could go uh, wrong went wrong. I will let my tech guy know that when we put this on podcast to edit that part out, we had technical issues a couple of weeks ago, but we tried again. We are now here. Uh, I don't know what the issues were, but we're gonna try again. They say if at first you don't succeed, try again. We're here again. Today is National Skyscraper Day. It's also the word of the day is serendipity. Uh, your incredible book, Documentaries and Serendipity, we're going to delve into tonight. But Robert, I begin all my shows by asking my guest, first of all, welcome to the show, uh, who or what are you celebrating tonight? I celebrate the fact that you don't give up and you came back. So who or what are you celebrating today? <laughs> I think uh, I'm very simply celebrating the uh, nice visit with my 18-year-old uh, granddaughter who just moved to New York from uh, the small college uh, town where she was attending and graduated uh, just a month or two ago. So. Uh, I'm happy to see her uh, pioneering her way on her own for the first time and uh, you know, looking for a wonderful future for her. Well, I hope so. Uh, is there any chance that your granddaughter, what's her name, by the way? Jessie. So, Jessie, if you're watching, uh, is there any chance that Jessie will follow in your footsteps? I don't think so. I think she's heading, she's a child, pro, she was a child prodigy. She's only 18 and she graduated from college at the age of 18. She entered at the age of 14, believe it or not. And the college had a special program for young precocious students. They all lived together in the same dorm. So they would be age related. Uh, that would help them uh, assimilate into their uh, educational experience more easily. Uh, but uh, she's interested in uh, in a very broad way in justice issues as I am, but uh, not in making documentary films. Well, God bless her, and I wish her a beautiful. I hope that her future um, is as exciting as your past has been, and that your present currently is. Uh, this book is uh, relatively new; it came out in June. Um, why did you decide to write this book, and why now? I decided because of my advanced age, and I figured all the good stories I've been telling people 
over the years uh, were interesting for some of them to say, gee, you should write that down sometime. So I decided, uh, getting late, I better dig it to it. And that's why now. So as I was reading your book, uh, Robert, it's uh, it truly is a history uh, almost of you know the 20th century. I mean, you started doing documentaries around 1958. Uh, and you know, very in the early uh, stages of television, your documentaries have been on every major network. Uh, you uh, nominated, uh, congratulations, uh, two Oscar nominations for your documentaries, uh, and uh, you uh, had the distinction of being called uh, one of uh, the most dangerous filmmakers out there uh, because of how you delved into your subjects. Uh, I want to ask you, in the world that we're currently living in, would you? How do you feel that you would have fared in today's world, uh, as far as the uh, way you approach your work? Well, I have occasionally thought about that very question, and uh, I wonder how I would, because uh, if I was uh, doing. If I'm doing now what I was doing then, I would wonder uh, how uh, I would uh, get out in the airwaves and people would uh, see and hear uh, the investigative pieces I did, the uh, sometimes outspoken, very outspoken pieces I did. And uh, uh, one of the things I did was produce a documentary uh, biography for a man who was running on a major party ticket for president of the United States. And uh, I would be happy to do that again for the right candidate. And uh, I uh, would hope that I would be able to uh, be as uh, open and uh, revealing as I was uh, at that time. Now, Robert, one of the things that I really admire reading the book uh, is uh, your incredible uh, honesty and what comes across to me as the reader as a lack of fear uh, in terms of telling your story and the experiences that you've gone through. Um, you know, I'm an entertainer first and foremost, and I am currently writing a show and there are so many stories that I wanna tell but I'm almost afraid to tell some of those stories on stage because I don't want to hurt anyone else's feelings. I don't want to uh, do anything that's going to offend anyone. Um, where does that uh, bravara comes from that you have? Was it always there? And did you develop that as you went on in life? Well, I think uh, I have to credit my mother in contrast and my father my mother was an outspoken activist and my father was uh, a very quiet spoken uh, lefty but uh, not at all uh, uh, ready to uh, voice his opinions as quickly and as easily as my mother did and uh, she uh, uh, somehow uh, imbued that her lack of fear or how her outspokenness, uh, I, got, I got her genes. Now, let's talk about your path uh, to begin with. Yeah. Um, are, are you a native New Yorker? I know that you went to uh, school in Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, but were you born here in New York? I was born about eight blocks from where I live now. Okay. In a hospital that no longer exists, but it was uh, at the time uh, in a, what it was and still is a Ukrainian neighborhood. And my mother had been a Ukrainian before she came to the, this country. And uh, that hospital, St. Mark's Hospital, uh, no longer is around, but uh, I am a native of New York, though I lived on the West Coast for about 15 years and part of that time in the state of Iowa as a graduate student at the university there, the Rutgers 
writers work stuff. So as you were growing up here in New York, and of course you're exposed to so many things here, uh, and I know that, as it says in uh, your book, that you originally aspired to be a writer, uh, and you are a great writer, uh, but did you always start out to be a writer? Was that your first goal in life? Well, uh, my first goal in life was to get away from home. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> yeah, and uh, go to college in California. Uh, and there uh, I began to write uh, a bit. And uh, when I went on to uh, additional colleges, uh, I wrote more. And uh, when I got to the Writer's Workshop in Iowa, I had uh, the amazing serendipity of meeting the man who uh, uh, turned out uh, after I left, he was the writer of the first 10 or 12 James Bond movies, a uh, fellow named Richard Maybaum. Uh, one of the, and his Bond movies are, everybody knows, probably the most successful franchise in uh, modern Hollywood, uh, of cinematic history. And he encouraged me to write. He said, you're a good writer, you should keep it up. And he and I would keep in touch over the years. And uh, I went out to California on business often and would be in touch with him. And uh, he was writing, at that time, I didn't know it was the, the Bond movies. They came out later uh, uh, at the time I mentioned. And uh, uh, I started writing, but uh, not fictional films, uh, documentaries, because uh, also at the University of Iowa, I saw a uh, television program with Edward R. Moore, mm -hmm. uh, the famous uh, journalist, uh, uh, Pudnett, uh, uh, who uh, was taking down Senator Joe McCarthy. And I watched that takedown on television and I switched internally. I had an epiphany. I said, no more fiction writing, no more novel writing. I want to make documentaries for Edward R. Murrow. And, well, nine, I mean, years, and nine years later. Matter, but, uh, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. Uh, and anything that you can put, uh, I'm a huge documentary film fan. Uh, when I'm looking for a film to watch, uh, I always gravitate towards documentaries first yeah. and foremost. Yeah. Well, anyway, and nine years after I saw that documentary and that switch to wanting to work for Murrow, I was working in his unit. That was a whole part of my story and how that happened, but uh, it did happen and uh, I continued from there uh, at CBS for five years and then set up my own company and produced uh, films that uh, sometimes I wished I had gotten on CBS and sometimes I regret that I didn't stay on at CBS, but uh, that became my long-term uh, career. Well, I want to go back to the title of your book, uh, yeah. Documentaries and Serendipity. Yeah. Uh, which is an amazing title. Uh, yeah. When was the first time, I mean, you mentioned serendipity, uh, meeting uh, the writer, I mean, the uh, filmmaker with the James Bond films. When is, in your life do you feel that you first experienced serendipity? Oh, boy. Well, I can tell you uh, the most <laughs> serendipitous experience I think I had in the middle of the Amazon jungle. Uh, it was uh, uh, a time when I was filming a man in that uh, spot in the Amazon uh, about his uh, efforts to try to save some of the uh, endangered tropical rainforest we all are increasingly aware of and worried about. and. Uh, there's no place to eat or sleep uh, for hours from there. So he invited me and my crew to have dinner 
at his uh, very spacious uh, home. And uh, turn out there were uh, uh, other people there as well who worked for him or were visiting him. And I was assigned a seat next to a woman who uh, introduced herself to me. And uh, uh, she asked me what I did. And uh, she was uh, a representative from the Ford Foundation in New York looking at uh, this gentleman's uh, project to save some of the rainforest. And uh, I told her that my film that I was there about uh, was about uh, efforts to save the rainforest. Can tropical rainforest be saved? The theme of that film. And she said, have you raised all your money yet? I said, no. She said, come and see me when you're in New York. There in the middle of the Amazon jungle, serendipitous experience, the rest of my money to make that film. Wow. And there so, it was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Going back to your writing, yeah. uh, did you always keep journals or as you sat down, I know that you said that you sat down to write this book because people encourage you to write because of the stories you're told. Yeah. Uh, did you keep journals or as you sat down to write this, was it automatic recall as you began to tell these stories? Well, some of it was automatic recall. Some of it was plumbing the depths of my memory. And some of it were diaries I kept on my uh, journeys uh, to do different kinds of filming. And uh, I refer to those journals uh, when I was writing the book. So it's a combination of all of uh, Now, as your career started to unfold, uh, a lot of the, I mean, the, these incredible documentaries that you did, um, were there things that you were actually pursuing or were a lot of them just falling into your lap? How were a lot of these projects coming your way? And was there one particular project that got away that you can tell us about now that you regret getting away? Well, one would lead to another often, oftentimes. Uh, and in a way that started with uh, a film I did uh, that made me the most dangerous American producer, according to uh, one of the major corporations in the world, Shell Oil Company. Uh, I had produced two films uh, about the export of pesticides and pharmaceutical projects that are banned or restricted for only certain uses in their country of origin and are sold in the developing world with uh, no information or wrong information. And uh, uh, that was uh, a major breakthrough in terms of journalistic uh, inquiry and investigation. Apparently, uh, no, it had not been done on television before. And uh, uh, it was uh, shocking of what I discovered in my investigation. Uh, and uh, uh, it was amazing to uh, hear the uh, spokesman for one of the uh, big pharma companies uh, sweat uh, profusely as that he was telling me uh, their excuses for continuing to uh, export to the third world a product that causes permanent sex changes in children. Little boys get female uh, characteristics and little girls get male characteristics like balding and deepening of the voice. And uh, uh, he, his uh, rationale was uh, so lame, it was uh, pitiful. And uh, I, I went to and interviewed the uh, head of the International Pharmaceutical Association based in Zurich, Switzerland. And I described this product and uh, this company. And I asked him what he thought. 
and he used one word that nailed it, reprehensible. Hmm. I came back to the United States and uh, uh, I had previously tried to interview the U.S. Pharmaceutical Association head who had refused to talk to me, but somehow the international guy must have gotten to the U.S. guy who called me and said, I'd like to do the interview. And uh, then he made his, uh, uh, I gave him his opportunity to make his uh, pitch. And um, that was, uh, anyway, uh, that film won a major uh, journalism award, one of the top uh, awards, if not some people consider it the top journal broadcast journalism award, the DuPont Columbia Journalism Award. And uh, uh, at the same time, or soon after that, Shell said I was the most dangerous man in the world. And about the same time, the American Association for the Advancement of Science gave me its Distinguished Science Reporting Award for those documentaries. So much, so much for danger, you know, for, <laughs> for, for revealing the truth, which can be dangerous. And along the way, uh, I had been offered a huge bribe to not get these films telecast, to withdraw them from the schedule. And uh, I gave the uh, big pharma guy who made that offer 30 days uh, to do what he said he would promise to do, which is um, uh, get uh, his company people to phone me and tell me about the wonderful things they do in dealing with exporting products. And uh, the 29th day of the 30-day limit, I got one phone call from one of his employees uh, who uh, gave me uh, a, uh, a, a comment uh, which was, uh, I've been told to call you because uh, We've just started putting a label on the cartons of our uh, boxes of the drugs that uh, we export. Uh, to, when we export them, we uh, now put the same information on the carton uh, that we put on uh, uh, the cartons that we ship around the United States. And I said, in what language was that? And he said, English, of course. <laughs> and when you get it, you're in another country and you, you get the carton, you unwrap, you unpack the carton, you usually toss the carton away. That doesn't do any good. So that was uh, uh, that was the beginning of uh, my going into global. Uh, issues of uh, this was a global problem as it turned out to be uh, and uh, it led to my dealing with uh, the agribusiness system where they grow food as cheaply as they can anywhere in the world and sell it at the highest price they can any of them, anywhere in the world regardless of the effect on the country in which those products uh, are grown and harvested and that led to a film I did about the uh, World Bank because uh, the World Bank is the funder of many of these huge plantations around the world that specialize in exporting their crops to uh, the rich countries or the rich inner cities where in those countries uh, and to examine the lending policies of uh, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, uh, which, uh, in which I included both sides, the bank and the fund side, and uh, the critics of the bank and from doing that, which led to the film about uh, Rainforest, the one I just mentioned before. Uh, and uh, so uh, it, it went from 
being a, a, a starting as a journalist and published television following local news in one state to national TV, CBS News, national politics, to global issues, <clears throat> to out, uh, out of the world issues. I did a film for, with it for Walter Cronkite, Outer Space, Can We Afford to Grow? Afford to Go? And uh, so uh, I feel uh, that's about as far as I want to go in that uh, arrow at this point, but that's part of my story. Well, with all of the films that you did, which of your films do you feel had the biggest impact in terms of making the biggest change in your life? Well, I think the film I made about Vietnam, uh, I was the first post-war American to make a documentary in Vietnam. I went there in 1978, and that was a uh, eye-opening change for me that uh, uh, probably had the biggest impact on my life. Uh, now, I want to talk about that for a moment. I had Billy Terrell on the show, uh, and Billy Terrell, uh, who served in Vietnam, yeah. after he came back from Vietnam, um, he was ostracized, uh, you know, he was blackballed by many people simply for serving, uh, it, uh, and uh, it changed his life. Uh, he couldn't get work for a while. Uh, he had to really struggle to get back uh, because there was such a division in this country at that time. Uh, how did that film impact your personal life in terms of how you were able to navigate those waters in terms of uh, getting work for yourself uh, in this business? Well, uh, it um, it was uh, an amazing experience uh, to uh, go to that country uh, as it was healing the wounds of war, as, as they described it when I was there, to meet, to go to My Lai, the notorious place of the My Lai massacre, I think I was the first American who ever went there after the massacre. And to meet a Milai survivor right at the site where all of her family was massacred, uh, it was so moving. And uh, uh, that kind of uh, experience just reinforced my determination to inform people about what war means really means and led me uh, down another path uh, that, that i've uh, followed uh, which led to another very important film i made called the last atomic bomb in which i uh, presented and filmed uh, two of the people who uh, survived uh, the uh, uh, bombing of Nagasaki, the last place uh, an atomic bomb was used during the war. And uh, uh, I became friends with the co-producer who gave me the idea of making the film and meeting several other survivors. And uh, uh, that uh, continues to move me and I've been involved uh, in every way I can to uh, try to help her and uh, her movement, which uh, uh, is part of a Nobel Peace Prize uh, organization called ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Uh, and her, uh, her work uh, involved uh, her going to Oslo to receive the Peace Prize with one of the uh, atomic bomb survivors. And uh, that was a very moving experience, very, very moving. Wow. Robert, so many times when I'm watching the news or if I watch a documentary, uh, I am so moved by so many stories. Uh, we hear about these news stories uh, and as tragic as some of them are, as moving as some of them are, we hear these news stories, and then 
we never hear anything else about the aftermath. Um, in your case, with some of these stories and these films that you've done, have you maintained relationships and friendships uh, with the people that were part of your films uh, years after those films? Specifically in one case, Roy Bourgeois, who, who, with whom I made a short film that got an Oscar nomination uh, called School of Assassins. And uh, then uh, he asked me a few years later to make another film, another film uh, uh, about uh, his new cause, uh, which was... Uh, uh, um, I'm trying to recall the name of it, but uh, I said I would make the new film only if he would make allow me to make a film about him and his crusade to close the School of Assassins. And he said, I'll let you make the other film uh, if you make this film, the short film, first. Uh, and uh, it gets a nominated for an Oscar also. So he challenged me. <laughs> I, made, I made that second short film, and guess what? It got nominated for an Oscar. And so he lost the bet, which allowed me to make a film about him and his crusade, Father Roy Inside the School of Assassins. And uh, uh, I am now trying to uh, get a fictional version of that horrible uh, uh, story uh, into a Hollywood film and I've written a script and uh, I've had uh, interest that uh, is uh, more than interest but not yet solidified and uh, I've been keeping up with Roy over the years and uh, we've become very good friends so that's wow. one of many examples if anyone can do it, uh, you can. Uh, I want to ask about another film uh, yeah. that uh, it, it just amazing, and that's Who Shot President Kennedy? Uh, and uh, just an amazing film. Uh, and uh, if you can tell us about, you know, the circumstances of how you went into this film and what you learned not only about this film yourself, uh, but about what you learned about you. Ah. Uh. Well, I was, uh, I had been working at CBS uh, producing documentaries uh, and uh, I was uh, a member of a production team within CBS to produce four one hours about uh, the Warren Commission and why uh, the Warren Commission uh, was right according to the executive producer uh, who uh, uh, may have been a skeptic at one point, but at this point uh, he was convinced the Warren Commission was right. And my assignment as one of a team of 10 producers in that unit for that four one hour series uh, project, my uh, assignment was to talk with and deal with the critics and to interview uh, uh, those uh, that seem relevant uh, or most the most new things to say. And uh, Mark Lane was then a best-selling author who had written two books that were bestsellers, uh, doubting the war report, doubting that one man had assassinated Kennedy on his own. And uh, I interviewed Lane and uh, others uh, who shared that view. And uh, I found uh, some very interesting uh, photographs at the National Archives, the archives that is uh, such a uh, focal point in the news these days for entirely different reasons because of documents that have not been returned there uh, from uh, higher authorities, shall we say. And um, uh, in those photographs, I saw 
a uh, two men uh, wearing three-piece suits and both uh, fedora hats uh, in the rental room in uh, Dallas that Lee Harvey Oswald used during the week uh, and uh, where he had not had window shades uh, and uh, he brought with him from his uh, weekend home with his wife uh, outside of Dallas uh, some window uh, uh, rods and uh, he possibly left them in his room uh, or he possibly brought them with him the morning of the assassination to bring to his room. Hmm. And uh, uh, the photos are of those two men hammering in those uh, rods into the above the windows. Now, and on the, on the bottom of the photos, it was uh, taken in the afternoon of November 22nd, 1963. What were those men hammering those rods in? Why? Who told them to? Who, who did they work for? I show those photos to the executive producer and he did nothing with them. And uh, do you think that in those moments that they're afraid or why do you think that they do not want to investigate those moments? Uh, I gave them the opportunity. They investigated another moment that they could uh, discount. I saw another, I got hold of another photo that became famous, the so-called Altkins photo of the school depository building. And in the doorway, you can see a man looking out at the, uh, the uh, Kennedy limousine um, entourage, and the man is dressed in a uh, long-sleeved uh, 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 kind of thing of, that uh, has designs on it, and uh, he resembles Oswald. And I found I found that photograph that was famous, but I also found another photograph of a man named Billy Lovelady in close-up, wearing a red and white broad-striped T-shirt. And uh, he also slightly resembled Oswald. And underneath his photo or an attached uh, a piece of paper, he said, I am Billy Lovely, and that is me in the uh, shirt I was wearing in the doorway at the time of the assassination. And I uh, uh, said, if that's lovely, it could be him because the guy is not wearing a short sleeve t shirt in the doorway, mm -hmm. a long sleeve khaki shirt with the designs on it. So I showed that to the executive producer, and he sent somebody to find Billy Lovelady. And they found him, and Billy said, well, yeah, that was me, but I didn't think it made any difference what I was wearing, so I just wrote that. I just signed that. didn't mean anything to me. And I said, well, you should put that in the documentary to show how, how uh, people were confused if that really is you and not lovely. Well, when Oswald was arrested, he was wearing a long sleeve shirt with precisely those designs. So it could have been Oswald in the doorway, and if it had been, it would not have given them time to run up six flights of stairs to the sixth floor window to take aim and shoot Kennedy. Uh, it was uh, at the moment of, uh, or within three, four seconds of the assassination, that this, that photo was taken of Hawkins, uh, taken in the in the doorway. 
Well, because they could uh, uh, investigate the, that and discount it uh, because of a lovely story that the critics uh, ultimately also believed, uh, they did not include anything about it or anything about uh, those uh, people hammering in the uh, the rods into the windows, window frames. And uh, I came to the uh, sad assumption that uh, I was there uh, not to uh, give them anything they would use because they would uh, discard. They discard anything that doubted the Warren report. And there was a fair amount of doubt and still is, I guess, in many people's opinion. And uh, 20 years later, I got the chance to make my own film uh, about the assassination where I re-examined the forensic evidence uh, of the assassination, of the acoustic evidence, as well as the visual evidence. And um, uh, went through the doubts and why there were doubts and uh, the context uh, and uh, the uh, gave the critics their opportunity to uh, speak their pieces about why they doubted uh, serious uh, people. Uh, one of them was a fellow uh, named Tink Thompson who had done it for Life magazine uh, and uh, concluded that uh, uh, Kennedy uh, was fired in by people in two different, two different directions, one behind him, one in front of him, or be hidden behind a fence uh, over which or through which he looked, looking through a, a hole in the fence. And uh, I'm not sure he's right, but he was convinced he was right. And uh, uh, just at a certain moment, you see... Uh, Kennedy's limousine with the wounded Kennedy uh, uh, as it's going past a, a sign on the highway. But at the very exact moment, the sign blocks Kennedy's face so you cannot see which direction his head is moving. Continue. The story I interview for my own film a nurse named Audrey Bell, who was uh, an admitting nurse mm -hmm. at the hospital where Kennedy was admitted, dead on arrival, but they were still trying to save him. And she saw the entry wound in Kennedy's neck that uh, the Warren Commission said was an exit wound. However, this wound was a place where a tracheotomy, tracheotomy was uh, entered to try to save King Kennedy's life. So the wound was distorted and disfigured uh, and uh, misshapen from the original wound by the insert of the tracheotomy needles. So you couldn't tell for sure there was an entry or an exit wound. There was another wound on the back of the shoulder. Uh, and um, Supposedly, that wound entered his shoulder, went through his neck, went through Governor John Connolly sitting directly in, in front of Kennedy, where it entered Connolly's back of his chest, through that chest, through uh, uh, his, uh, el his arm, and the bullet continued into his thigh and emerged as an almost pristine bullet. It was found on a gurney in the hospital by a hospital attendant who just happened to come across it uh, next to where, on, where Governor Connolly's gurney was. And uh, he presented that bullet to the cops and uh, that became the magic bullet that supposedly did all that damage and emerged, emerged almost pristine. The man who, the surgeon 
uh, I think Dr. Robert Shaw, I believe his name is, um, said uh, he saw that bullet and he had never seen a bullet uh, do all of that damage to a human being or two human beings and emerge in such an almost pristine condition, which of course is to further doubt doesn't prove it, but it certainly adds to the doubt. Oops, I'm hearing the bell. Ignore it. Wow. Just anyway, to... I then went on to uh, <laughs> uh, Walter Cronkite was then just resigning from CBS News because he had reached the magic age of 65 and that was the apparent reason uh, he had to resign. And he had been planning to do his own uh, documentary about the 25th anniversary or commemoration of the death of Kennedy. Uh, anniversary is kind of the wrong kind of word with the, the day 25 years earlier Kennedy had died. And he, there was a big article in the New York Times that uh, said Cronkite, because he no longer worked for uh, CBS, could do that documentary. So I called him. Or I wrote him a note, and then he called me back and said, yes, he'd like to do the, be my narrator. So I got Walter to narrate. I had worked with him at CBS uh, over the years, uh, and we became friends. So... Uh, it was a pleasant surprise, and uh, he uh, was happy to join me, and uh, that, there's a funny little story or two about that. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, agreed to uh, come down from Martha's Vineyard, where he spent the, spent the time at that point of living on his yacht. So he said uh, he would moor his yacht in Annapolis, Maryland at a dock. Uh, he would do that. He would sail or yacht down uh, over the weekend. And he would see me Monday morning. And um, so Monday morning, uh, and, uh, I called him and I said, we're ready for you when you're ready to come. And he said, I'm exhausted. I said, oh my God, he's not going to make it. Uh, I said, was it, the, was it rough weather coming down? He said, no, it's my mother. I said, well, is she okay? Well, she's 103 and she's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> she's 97 and she's wonderful. Uh, and I spent the weekend with her, helping her move to a smaller apartment. And every broken dish was an argument. You can't, you can't throw that away. So and so ate on it, and so that exhausted him. And he said, ten thirty is too early, uh, uh, kind of early. Uh, how long is your narration anyway?" I said, eh, "Well, it's about half an hour out of the hour." And he said, "Well, uh, I'll show up around noon, and we'll be out of there by twelve thirty, and." Uh, then we can have lunch somewhere. I said, 1230, that won't give you time to rehearse. Rehearse? I don't rehearse. I'm one take, <laughs> I'm one take Cronkite. Oh, I said, I forgot you. I forgot that. And he showed up at noon, and uh, there was only one sentence in my narration. He uh, questioned where I uh, wrote that uh, even President Johnson thought there might have been a conspiracy. And uh, I asked Walter, or Walter asked me, he said, where'd you get that? I said, from your interview with him on his ranch. And Walter Cronkite said, he didn't say exactly that. He said, I don't see how one man could have done it alone. That is not the same thing as a conspiracy. Close to that, but uh, I, I rewrote the line uh, to go along with Walt. As Walter said, and uh, the rest of it was just as I wrote it. Did he read through what you had written before he sat down to do it, or did that come up as he was reading it? 
came up as he was reading it. He had not read it before. Uh, I was going to email him the narration. He said he didn't have a place to read. He didn't have a computer. Email it to him. There was an email at that time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Uh, wow. That's you know, amazing. What an amazing story that is. I mean, we're going to run out of time. Um, Robert, I want you to come back. I mean, because there are so many great stories here. But I want to ask you, I mean, when you sat down to write the book, um, did you go back and look at all of your films again? Um, and if so, is it easy for you to go back and look at your films? Or do you now look at them and say, I would have changed anything? Or do you are you happy with things as they are? Ah, uh, well... I would change the Who Shot President Kennedy one a little uh, because uh, uh, they're uh, like the Billy Lovelady story I'm telling you about. I would put that into uh, this film. Uh, you know, we do little things there. Uh, I would love to go back to Vietnam if I was younger and healthy enough, mobile enough to see how things have changed since I was there. I'd love to, to go back to Nagasaki and uh, the uh, survivor I uh, met who was age 10 at the time she survived. She's still around and I like to see how she's doing and maybe film her. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the ones I, the films I did about exporting pills and pesticides, I'd love to uh, update those uh, to see if that has changed in any way. It's supposed to have changed, but uh, I have no idea. If Out of everything that's going on in the world right now, what would you love to do a documentary on? Oh, my goodness. Uh, how old would I be? Um, efforts to uh, get rid of nuclear uh, weapons and nuclear power because they were linked. And uh, as you know, in the Ukraine situation, the uh, possibility of radiation escaping from the uh, largest nuclear power station in Europe is uh, endangered. And uh, I think Fukushima is another example of that, that where there was a near meltdown. Uh, I, perhaps I would like to do that, but uh, uh, maybe I would think of a more, more upbeat subject next time. Well, I want to ask you one last question. It's going to be a two-part question. Yeah. Um, you have seen so many changes in uh, the way that we look at our news, the way we uh, receive our news. Uh, what are you optimistic about as far as our news today? And what concerns you about the way we get our news now? Well, I'm concerned with the, the huge audience uh, Fox News gets because uh, I uh, think they have every right to be on and uh, report the news, but it's often not news, it's propaganda, as far as I'm concerned, or it's downright lies, or it's distortion of the news. And I'm concerned about that, and uh, you know, I, I defend their right to say what they have to say, but I dislike it immensely. I occasionally watch and reinforce my dislike just about every time. Uh, I'm glad to see that uh, there are so many new opportunities for uh, a diversity of uh, sources for news and the opportunity through, through uh, television and the internet to see uh, news from so many different places around the world and even on America with uh, uh, the uh, opportunities that... Uh, show up on the uh, American uh, television screen if uh, you're willing to hunt them down, like Al Jazeera, mm -hmm. the Middle East uh, network, uh, which uh, 
Uh, I visited them in the, their headquarters in Jordan when I was at a film festival there a number of years ago, and they are terrific, and they they do excellent journalism at the highest standards. Uh, and uh, well, more of, that, more of that the better. We are we are going to give away a copy of your book now. I mean, you are riveting, and uh, I'm glad that we made this happen. And I'm sorry about the glitch at the beginning of the show. Uh, again, uh, as someone pointed out, Mercury is in retrograde. <laughs> so anything can and possibly will happen, and it did. Uh, those of you who signed on here, thank you so much. We'll see who's going to get the book, and Robert, we'll talk uh, later about how we're going to get that book to them. Uh, Aaron Caleb, thank you. And Aaron is sponsoring this show uh, for the next uh, month, so thank you, Aaron. Uh, see what happens when you do a good deed. You get a great book. And uh, Robert, if you can sign it for Aaron, that'll be even better. Uh, so um, I'm going to say a few closing remarks. And then, uh, Robert, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you have your last word tonight because this is all about you. Um, serendipity. Uh, I love this title, Documentaries and Serendipity. These documentaries, uh, many of them are available on Netflix. Uh, or Amazon uh, Prime, you can go on and you can see them. They are amazing films. Uh, check his work out. Uh, the book is available on Amazon.com. Uh, I could not put this book down. I read the book when I first got it, and then I went and read it again uh, in preparation for tonight so that I could be uh, up on this. Uh, Robert, you are an amazing man. I thank you for the gifts that you've given to the world and that you will continue to give. Uh, your film uh, will last forever. And you've got the book here to go along with those films. So thank you for that. Um, I end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything return. Uh, go to your Facebook friends list and reach out to the ninth name that pops up and reach out with a phone call. Not an email, not a uh, text message, not a private inbox message, but a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you. Uh, or better yet, go to Amazon.com, and if you're able to do it, order two copies of this book. Keep one copy for yourself, and then send one to that ninth friend. And let them know what they mean to you by a little inscription in the book. That's even better to do that that way. Um, and also, uh, I always say, you know, with that phone call, uh, by doing so, you know, you never know what someone else is going through right now. Uh, Robert uh, has walked the walk. He talks the talk. He put his mouth out there, and he made a real difference in the world. And we can all do that. And serendipity happens when you get out and you meet people and you show up. And that's what it's all about. It's all about showing up and getting out there and doing these things. And you'll find as you read this book that it happens over and over and over again. Again, it's not just a title, it's a life. It's a lifetime of experiences. So again, I'm gonna leave the screen, Robert. I always say by reaching out with that phone call, as my dear friend, Sean Monaghan always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're gonna go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. So Robert, I'm gonna leave the screen. I'm gonna give you the final word. Uh, anything you wanna say about anything that we talked about tonight that you wanna build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any final message that you wanna leave everyone with tonight, don't worry about how to end it. As soon as you say goodbye, I will start the closing credits. Thank you, Robert, for being here and I hope that you'll come back sometime. Thank you. And everybody, have a great night and an even better tomorrow, and have a safe weekend. Robert, it's all yours. First, I want to thank Rutanya Aldo, your friend who steered you to me. And uh, I continue to try to do what I've always been doing, and I'm branching out into uh, fictional screenplay writing, some of it based on the documentaries I've made, and uh, uh, I'm uh, as, as old as I am, 
you, it may be hard for you to believe that I'm in my 90s, but I am, and uh, I'm still uh, working away at what I have enjoyed and uh, have considered my mission in life uh, for so many decades. And uh, I wish you all uh, a peaceful and uh, problem-free world, a dream that must come true if it only is consistently made efforts by you to do that. Uh, I uh, really am glad to have had this opportunity to uh, be here with Richard. I think uh, it was a nice experience for me, very nice experience. And uh, I hope this leads to more. Thanks and goodbye.